Like Breath of the Wild, The Wind Waker is set years after a calamity brought ruin to Hyrule. Long after he was sealed by the hero of time and the sages, Ganon returned in a red wrath, attacking the sages of earth and wind and laying siege to Hyrule. The people prayed for a hero, but no hero came. Centuries later, that kingdom is lost below the waves of the Great Sea, the result of a colossal flood sent by the gods, a last resort to stop Ganon. The Wind Waker is about a boy who loses his sister and ends up discovering this forgotten kingdom. The Wind Waker is set in the same world as Ocarina of Time, only centuries later, drowned in the ethereal Great Sea. The game is about rediscovering this kingdom, especially the game's dungeons. Today, I'm joined by Bandit for lore and theories on every Wind Waker dungeon. Half will be covered in this video, and half in a video on his channel. Be sure to check that out afterwards. Let's start with Dragon Roost Cavern. The Wind Waker's first proper dungeon is Dragon Roost Cavern, found inside a volcanic island, which serves as the home of the Rito tribe. When a Rito child reaches adulthood, they travel through the cavern as a rite of passage. Despite them being a bird-like evolution of the Zora, the Rito aren't born with wings. They have to earn them by climbing to the top of their island to meet Valu, the Sky Spirit who gives them a scale which enables them to take flight. By the time of the game, however, Valu is enraged. His fury confuses the Rito, whose young now cannot journey through the cavern to earn their wings. Particularly worrying is the Rito Prince, Kamali, who is terrified of Valu's rage and lacks the courage to journey to him. Valu's attendant is Medley, a young Rito girl who doesn't have a complete grasp on the ancient Hylian tongue spoken by the dragon. She doesn't know what has caused this change of mood and blames herself for Kamali's problem. With Link's help, she enters Dragon Roost Cavern with the intention of climbing to Valu to talk to him, but is kidnapped by Bokoblins not long after and imprisoned in a cage near the mountain's peak. Link enters the dungeon in pursuits, where he eventually discovers the truth behind Valu's condition. He's being tortured by Goma, a parasitic creation of Ganondorf who lurks in the chamber directly below the dragon. Though the cavern is at the heart of Rito culture and serves as a kind of trial for their young, it seems unlikely that it was built by them. As I mentioned, many locations in the Wind Waker are places from Ocarina of Time. When Hyrule flooded, the tallest mountaintops became islands. So it's easy to believe that Dragon Roost Island is what has become of Death Mountain, the ancestral home of the Gorons. The obvious connections are that Dragon Roost and Death Mountain are both giant volcanic peaks with a ring of clouds at the top, found in similar locations on the map. In fact, a short sail west of Dragon Roost is Windfall Island, a bustling market town which seems to be what remains of Kakariko Village. Check this video out on that topic if you haven't already, which lines up well with Kakariko's position at the foot of Death Mountain. By the time of the Wind Waker, Gorons seem to be missing. They're not, a few Gorons travel the Great Sea as merchants, their birthplace unknown. So, perhaps the Great Flood caused the Gorons to abandon their ancestral home, which eventually became the nest of the Rito once they evolved from the Zora. The Gorons, now without a home, took up a nomadic lifestyle as wandering merchants. In Ocarina of Time, a Goron refers to bomb flowers as Death Mountain's special crop a mining plant native only to the volcano's fiery slopes and tunnels. By the time of the Wind Waker, they're found in multiple areas across the Great Sea, but nowhere more so than Dragon Roost Island. While the island's main theme music is a lively, absurdly catchy tune, 
the music of Dragon Roost Cavern is ambient and haunting. In fact, it's heavily based on the music from Dodongo's Cavern, a Goron mine found on Death Mountain Trail and Ocarina of Time's second dungeon. These two dungeons share more similarities than just music, though. To access the dungeon proper, Link needs to move statues that block his way. Statues that appear to be abstract depictions of Gorons. They're not exact, their noses are larger than you'd expect for Gorons, but their design matches the rock people better than any other race in the series. Symbolically, it's interesting that Link, and the countless Rito that journeyed through the cavern before him, must push the Gorons aside before setting foot in what might have once been their home. The dungeon also features depictions of a dragon. Now, obviously, the island's called Dragon Roost, named for Valu who sits atop it. But Valu is a somewhat portly dragon with four limbs and comically tiny wings. And these dragons are serpentine, much closer to the dragons of Breath of the Wild, or Ocarina of Time's Volvagia. Hyrule Historia confirms that, just as Jaboon is descended from Lord Jabu Jabu, and the Wind Waker's Deku Tree is descended from the Deku Tree in Ocarina of Time, Valu is in some way descended from Volvagia. But despite being Valu's ancestor, Volvagia was evil. It ate Gorons, and was defeated by a Goron hero who wielded the Megaton Hammer in the distant past. And the depictions of a dragon in Dragon Roost Cavern definitely read more as a warning than anything else. Not just the twin serpentine dragons painted on walls, but rocks carved into jagged teeth, and menacing visages with burning eyes around doors. These designs seem to depict a dangerous, serpentine dragon. To travel through doors in the dungeon, Link needs to enter its jaws. These could be depictions of Volvagia, Valu's ancestor, the Goron-eating dragon from an era long past, immortalized on the walls of an ancient Goron cave. The Zelda Encyclopedia disputes this idea, however instead suggesting that Dragon Roost Island is what has become of Ocarina of Time's Zora's Domain, which would mean that this island was always inhabited by the Rito and their ancestors. But the book itself admits that, occasionally, the writers added their own interpretations to expand on the game's stories, and I'd argue that this is an example of that. It's possible that Ocarina of Time's Zora's Domain eventually became Dragon Roost Island, and in a way, it does. The Rito are the evolution of the Zora, and so Dragon Roost becomes their domain. But I think that the intention behind this mountain, and the dungeon inside it, was to be the successor to Death Mountain. But we can't discuss Dragon Roost's connections to Death Mountain without mentioning the island just south of it, Fire Mountain. This isn't strictly home to a dungeon. Along with Ice Mountain, it's a mini challenge that rewards Link with an item that allows him to access a dungeon later on. The mountain is an active volcano, with lava spewing from the peak. Link needs to use an ice arrow to freeze the mountain to gain access, and only then for 5 minutes until the eruption continues. So this is another volcano found in roughly the same place as Ocarina of Time's Death Mountain. It's also where Link obtains the power bracelets, which grant him superhuman strength. Not unlike how Death Mountain is where he's given the Goron bracelet. The interior of the mini dungeon is absolutely tiny. It's a single room where Link needs to hop on rocks floating in a lava pool to reach the chest on the other side. Fire Mountain and Dragon Roost then could both be Death Mountain. In fact, it's not impossible that two volcanic peaks so close together are just two peaks of the same larger volcano, most of which lurks beneath the waves. After all, Death Mountain in Ocarina of Time was huge. It's not hard to believe that after a flood and several hundred years, this mountain range could have eroded into two volcanic peaks, piercing above the surface as islands. Like Dragon Roost Cavern, the interior of Fire Mountain could both have once been designed by the Gorons and now lies abandoned. The power bracelets could have been forged by ancient Gorons to grant their strength to weaker beings, a treasure that nobody could recover until the Hero of Winds set sail.
The Tower of the Gods is the Wind Waker's third main dungeon. After he's collected the Goddess Pearls from Kamali, the Great Deku Tree, and Jaboon, Link can place them in the hands of statues on three islands across the Great Sea. Three islands in the shape of a triangle. At the centre of this triangle lies the Tower of the Gods, a stone pillar that is summoned from the depths of the Great Sea. Unlike most other dungeons, the history and original purpose of the tower is made crystal clear. The King of Red Lions explains that the tower was created by the gods of the Old World so that they could test the courage of men. Only one who is able to overcome the trials within will be acknowledged by the gods as a true hero, one worthy of wielding the Master Sword. It's clear that the Tower of the Gods was designed for use after the Great Flood. The entire bottom floor involves the sea itself for puzzles. The Tower of the Gods is a vertical dungeon. Link needs to climb from the bottom to the top. He climbs towards the heavens to gain approval from the gods. Many of the tower's puzzles involve moving around small statues, known as servants of the tower. These are short, made from some sort of black stone, each with a grimacing face and a set of horns. The designs of the servants are found all throughout the dungeon, on pillars, above doors, even as the source of the waterfall blocking entrance to the tower from the ground floor. The dungeon's boss is Godan, the Great Arbiter. Godan is a machine designed to be the final test for potential heroes, found at the very top of the tower. Unlike the game's other bosses, Godan isn't linked to Ganondorf at all. Once defeated, he simply returns to his place in the wall, allowing Link to reach the roof and ring the tower's bell for the gods to hear. These gods that Link demonstrates his worthiness to are the Old Gods, the Golden Goddesses Din, Nehru, and Faror, rather than Hylia or some other deity as the pearls and statues used to summon the tower bear their names and emblems. The concept of a trial from the gods has been seen multiple times throughout the series. Skyward Sword is about forging Link into a hero able to stop demise, and Breath of the Wild has the ancient Sheikah shrines, trials in the name of the goddess Hylia. The latter is the most interesting connection. Like the Sheikah Shrines, the Tower of the Gods is full of mysterious, ancient technology powered by a bright blue glow, and is marked with similar constellation patterns. It's possible that the Tower of the Gods is a sort of proto-shrine, perhaps even constructed by the Sheikah under the Gods' orders. But even if this isn't the case, it's still another example of a divine trial involving advanced technology. Breath of the Wild's ancient technology is some form of sacred energy. The only weapons that can harm Dark Beast Ganon are the two bows of light, beams from the Master Sword, and ancient arrows. So, as the Tower of the Gods was built by the gods, the technology found here probably has even more similarities to Sheikah tech than it initially appears. The Tower of the Gods is a place designed to find the successor to the Hero of Time, and, as such, is one of the Wind Waker's most important dungeons. And while we're on the topic of trials, although it's not a proper dungeon, it's worth noting the Savage Labyrinth here too. This combat gauntlet challenge is found on Outset Island of all places, a deep cave of many layers packed with dangerous enemies. The design of the labyrinth switches between that of a standard cave and more ornate stone rooms. It's never made explicitly clear who built the Savage Labyrinth, but we can make a solid guess. The stonework matches that found in other caves and grottos that house Triforce shards or charts, which not only feature the same pillars, but also statues of the servants of the Tower of the Gods. Since the labyrinth also contains a shard of the Triforce of Courage, or a sea chart leading to a shard in the original version, it's not a stretch to assume that, like the Tower of the Gods, the Savage Labyrinth was designed to test the hero, a place for Link to prove his worth and claim his Triforce piece. In the HD version, the labyrinth is even home to the hero's charm, a Sheikah artifact, which could further the connection between these trials built for the hero and the Sheikah. The Earth Temple is one of two sage dungeons in the Wind Waker. 
Along with the Wind Temple, where Makar awakens as the Sage of Wind, the Earth Temple is where Medley learns of her purpose to grant the Master Sword its sacred power to repel evil as the Sage of Earth. This was the ancient purpose of the Earth Temple, just as it was with the Wind, a place designed to house a Sage. For an age, this Sage was Laruto, a Zora born in Zora's Domain. We know that the temple was built by, or controlled by, the Hyrulean royal family, or their servants the Sheikah at some point, evidenced by the royal crest found in the boss chamber, just like the Wind Temple. The Earth Temple was located on top of one of Hyrule's tallest peaks, meaning that it's still possible to access it from islands on the Great Sea. The temple did once have another entrance to access from Hyrule, though now it's buried beneath the waves. The Earth Temple is accessed from Headstone Island, obviously named because of the giant stone head that blocks the entrance. But Headstone has another meaning, a tombstone, a slab designed to mark a grave. By lifting the stone head and descending into the Earth Temple, Link lowers himself into the realm of the dead. Because despite its holy purpose, the Earth Temple is dark. As well as a place for a sage to pray, it's a crypt where the dead rest. Its halls are filled with rows of stone coffins, ancient, crumbling columns and passageways covered in depictions of skulls and even scythes like that of the Grim Reaper give the Earth Temple the feeling of a mausoleum, or underground catacombs designed to house the dead. According to the King of Red Lions, the Earth Temple has become the nest of an evil creature. Jalhalla, the same creature that took Laruto's life long ago. The sage explains that once Ganon broke free of his seal, he returned to Hyrule in a red wrath. He attacked the Earth Temple and killed Laruto, knowing that he had to remove the Master Sword's power. Jalhalla itself is apparently the ruler of all Poes. While it takes the form of a gigantic ghost, its body is actually made of a group of smaller Poes. Jalhalla itself seems to be just a mask. After Link defeats the Poes, the mask tries to escape, but is vanquished by the light. Jalhalla shares Mulgara's title of Protector of the Seal. The bosses were summoned by Ganondorf to strip the Master Sword of its power to repel evil. Laruto claims that Ganondorf stole her soul, so it could be that Jalhalla protects a seal on the soul of the Sage of Earth, Laruto. Once defeated, the seal is broken, and Laruto can pass the torch on to Medley and restore power to the blade. As with any dungeon full of monsters, it's difficult to tell which were found here because of Ganon's power and influence, and which, if any, were here before. We know that Jalhalla was sent by Ganondorf to kill Laruto, and the dungeon is infested with Moblins, Ganon's elite minions. Perhaps the temple was once a quiet house of the dead, a place of both burial and prayer, until it became the nest of Jalhalla, who breathed new life into the corpses found there. Except for this. The Earth Temple's central icon, found in the main chamber, appears to be a statue of a re-dead. It's a grey figure with a nightmarish grin, with hooped earrings and white tattoos. The statue supports itself on its hands, like it's crawling out of a grave, lifting itself up to look towards the cage where Medley will be trapped if she's taken by a floor master. A prisoner in this cell would see nothing but the Redead smiling back at them. Redeads are weak to light, and once Link has the mirror shield, he and Medley are able to reflect light onto the Redead statue, transforming it into a beaming sun, the triumph of light over darkness. There's another Redead face puzzle later on in the dungeon, an integral part of the room, making it likely that these statues long predate Ganondorf's return and Jalhalla's presence in the dungeon. The same could be said for the mini-boss chamber. The Earth Temple's doors are carved with a skull wreathed in flame, similar to a bubble, but the mini-boss room's door has a large, horned skull. Inside, the room is designed to enshrine the mirror shield, the key to bringing light into the darkness. 
but is also lined with coffins, each containing a Stalfos, with a third lurking beneath the ground. The carving on the door warns outsiders that the dead walk inside. In Ocarina of Time, Stalfos are what becomes of people who are lost in the woods. It's not clear what they are in the Wind Waker, they don't look human. They do bear some similarities to the servants of Egos du Ikana from Majora's Mask. They were once the best swordsmen in the kingdom, but are now Stalfos, wearing hats with a red plume. Perhaps the Wind Waker's Stalfos were once great warriors, like this scrapped design for a Swordmaster enemy. Either way, it seems that they were deliberately entombed here alongside the Mirror Shield, to guard the Earth Temple's most important treasure. The Wind Waker's re-deads resemble mummies. Though they're emaciated and discoloured, and emerge from coffins, they've been preserved, marked with tattoos and jewellery. If the Earth Temple represents the relationship between light and darkness, life and death, nowhere is this highlighted better than the Redeads, creatures that seem to be deliberately preserved in a state somewhere between living and dead. No wonder the dungeon's halls echo with their screams. The builders of the Earth Temple were aware of the Redeads. They're as important a part of this labyrinth as the stones that it's built from. These undead terrors predate Ganondorf, and have always lurked in the depths of the temple. In many ways, these Redead resemble the Sheikah monks in Breath of the Wild. Both are emaciated, skeletal figures with blue skin, white tattoos, and gold jewellery. Ocarina of Time's Shadow Temple shows us a much darker side to the Sheikah tribe. It's a torture chamber built to interrogate enemies of the royal family during the Hyrulean Civil War. Perhaps the Wind Waker's Redeads were Sheikah, who, much like the monks, underwent a mummification process, perhaps to defend the temple forever. The Earth Temple was built for a holy purpose, to house a sage of the Master Sword. But even before Ganon's influence, it was a temple designed to venerate death. It could be that for the Sacred Sword to retain its power to repel evil, to prevent the death that Ganondorf would bring, half of the prayers must come from a place so deeply connected to the dead, and perhaps to task a hero with overcoming death itself. Ganon's Tower is the final dungeon in The Wind Waker, much like Ocarina of Time before it. It's found in the sunken kingdom of Hyrule below the surface of the Great Sea, outside the barrier protecting Hyrule Castle. Ganon's Tower is found in a desert, presumably what has become of the Gerudo Desert from Ocarina of Time. The King of Red Lions explains that, long ago, Ganon's Tower was an impenetrable fortress that not even the daring knights of Hyrule could hope to assail. The tower was his base of operations during his war against Hyrule centuries ago, the war in which no hero appeared and the gods were forced to flood the land. Link first explores the tower's basement, or rather a cave directly below the tower. This area is very similar to Ganon's castle from Ocarina of Time. To open the main door found underneath a gigantic horned skull, Link needs to complete four subsections, themed after the main four bosses that Ganondorf created. Goma from Dragonroost Cavern, the Kale Demos from Forest Haven, Mogera from the Wind Temple, and Jalhala from the Earth Temple. These four bosses are represented by symbols on their doors, and by defeating them again in an illusory battle, their seal on the door is broken. Godan and a section based on the Tower of the Gods is missing, obviously because Ganondorf didn't create Godan, the old gods did. Once the bosses have been defeated, Link can gain access to the main tower, which is really just a lot of stairs. There's a definite Chinese influence here. Ganondorf is like an ancient emperor found at the top of his opulent palace. After the first set of stairs, Link reaches what are, in essence, the main rooms of the tower, including a maze where Phantom Ganon is fought for the final time. A portal can be found here that leads directly to the Forsaken Fortress. The King of Red Lions notes that this is how Ganondorf gained access to the world above. As the tower is found in a desert and sunken Hyrule, it would make sense that the Forsaken Fortress is directly above this on the surface, right on top of the Gerudo Desert. In two of these main rooms, we can again find symbols representing the four bosses from the basement, but there's now a fifth, Ganon himself, who can be seen on the doors and walls. In one of these rooms is a clue left by Ganondorf himself, a hint on how to solve the Phantom Ganon maze and reach the top of the tower, which just goes to show that Ganondorf is as cocky as he is dangerous. 
After defeating Phantom Ganon in the maze and obtaining the light arrows, Link climbs more stairs, guarded by all manner of enemies, until he reaches the final door, behind which Ganondorf himself is found. Fittingly, this door is ornate, red and gold with Ganon's face staring back at you. It's through these that the game's two final boss fights take place. First, Phantom Ganon fought at the bottom of a gigantic cylindrical room, probably the inside of the main section of Ganon's tower. There's a lot to be said about Puppet Ganon and what it means. Its figurine describes it as a marionette created by Ganondorf himself, but ultimately it's just an illusion. Like Phantom Ganon before it, Puppet Ganon is simply a tool used by Ganondorf, who appears to control it from the rafters above. He calls Link to the roof to stand before him, which is where the game's final events play out. Overall, Ganon's Tower is a fascinating look into Ganondorf's history in the adult timeline. We're never shown the events that took place prior to the Great Flood, when Ganondorf returned and laid siege to Hyrule, but this tower is a relic from that time, when Ganondorf was an emperor, closer to a god than a man. Like Ganon's castle in Ocarina of Time, it's a testament to his majesty. It immortalizes his creations on the walls and celebrates the bestial form of Ganon on the doors. It was his base of operations before the Flood, and it was from here that he plotted his return. So, that's Dragon Roost Cavern, Tower of the Gods, Fire Mountain, the Earth Temple, and Ganon's Tower covered. But as Zeltic said at the beginning, this is only half of the Wind Waker's dungeons. For the analysis of the remaining lore and story of the Forbidden Woods, Forsaken Fortress, Ice Ring Isle, the Wind Temple, and the Ghost Ship, please feel free to check out the other part to this video over on my channel with the card or link in the description. And as always, thank you so much to Zeltic and you the viewers for having me. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Again, be sure to check out the other half of this collaboration on Bandit Games' channel. As always, a huge thank you to channel members, including Myth Tier members, Zelda But A Girl, Lily, Pappy Chris, Rice Glight, Vampy Foot, Thomas Drury Wang, Celestial Kitsune, Monkey Gamer Z Official, and Gerudo Eli. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.